Hello everyone, Dan Swift here, founder and CEO at Numentum. And welcome to the speaker series, where we spotlight some of the most interesting minds in the world of revenue generation. At Numentum, we help forward-thinking B2B organizations create better buyer experiences and deliver new momentum to their revenue engine. On this episode of the speaker series, we speak with Tom Buder, Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer at Airship. We have a great conversation about a company's most important objectives, the relationship between sales and marketing, and the importance of being a good person before being a good business person. I'm delighted to have you on, sir. How are you? I'm well. Great to see you and your smiling face and your new brightly colored uh, brand. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you very much. Bringing some uh, some orange into people's lives now. So, um, well, listen, for everyone listening today, I am delighted to have Tom on. Tom and I met in 2015. We have worked together. Tom has been a customer of Numentum's twice now. So really delighted to spend some time with you, Tom. Now, I think for everyone's edification, let's start with what you're doing right now. So you are the Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer at Airship. Can you tell us a little bit about the company and then also a little bit about your role as well? Sure. Um, so Airship is a SaaS software company. We've been around for 14 years. And I would say that uh, you interact with our software probably every day, uh, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, the reason I say that is my assumption is you have a phone. Um, you probably have apps on your phone. And um, we, we're a software platform that helps power uh, many of the experiences you have in each of those apps. So mm -hmm. we work with leading brands, um, you know, from uh, those that sell coffee uh, to, uh, to, to the, those that provide shoes that you might run in uh, or play sport in or airlines that you might get your mobile boarding pass from or news organizations that you might get your news or entertainment from. Um, and we, we create different types of experiences from how you discover the app in the app store to um, your onboarding experience to uh, your preference setting to your um, engagement um, profile, how to make it personalized for you <clears throat> to your loyalty schemes. <clears throat> so yeah. that's what Airship does. Yeah. Amazing. An app now, experience um, platform. Uh, yeah. 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 That, that, well, listen, um, yes, I do have a phone. Yes, I do have lots of apps on them. So that means I guess uh, I'm a customer of yours by default. So um, now, now in your role, you're going to get pulled in all sorts of different directions, I'm sure. So for the folks listening, what's your guidance to them in terms of how, how to stay focused? How do you stay focused um, on what's most important and what absolutely needs to get done? Um, well, we have, um, I think we've done a pretty good job as, as a leadership team of, um, of establishing yet another acronym. Uh, it's a V. F O, which stands for very um, vital few objectives. Uh -huh. And if you can actually identify what the vital few objectives are for the company, um, then you should be in a position to cascade that down into your own function. So mm. it's super clear. Like we have like three or four, which, which you shouldn't have more than five. Um, we right. have th really three or four um objectives and it and those are clear what our strategic um you know roles should be so um so that helps me stay really focused and 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 because there's a lot of hopper you know as as you know you get you get a ton of inbound um people saying you know you know how come you haven't considered this or should you consider that or why not consider this and you get a lot of opinions about what to do from internal folks but if it's not tied to help the plans that we've put in place to help us achieve those objectives for the company, um, then I try to let it, I let it go. Yeah. I love that. And that really resonates as well, because when you and I work together and I've taken this from that experience to what we're doing now, any member of the organization should be able to look at what they're doing in the moment. Right. And say, does this actually roll up into one of the things that the company is focused on 
or not? And if not, should I be doing this? So you've seen a bit of that going on at, at Airship as well. For sure. Yeah. And yeah. and there was a time as we there was a time when we were um shifting our positioning, as it were, mm -hmm. um, where there were people that were a little bit stuck um in how it used to be and a little bit in you know, the past way of how we would represent the company, who we, who we would be talking to, how we would, we would be talking to them, what we would be selling um, mm -hmm. to where we are now, which is a very different kind of conversation. And you experienced that, you know, when we worked together at Sprinkler, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what's something that people who are not in the role probably need to know about the pressures of the role? What would you tell them? Um, I think it's really simple, um, and that is you have um, you have a ton of uh, you have a ton of responsibility um, mm -hmm. to set the strategic direction of the company. Because I think mm -hmm. what I mean the the balance of strategy and marketing is that you're establishing that strategic um, direction, and and you're having to um, line up or help line up everything behind that to prove mm. that strategy, right? Um, and so the pressure comes from having the uh, having the, the responsibility for establishing that strategic direction and, and trying to enroll others and ensure that everything lines up to prove that out so you get more value from it, but not mm. having the, the not having the authority um, really or even the the sort of control of the teams that you're having to enroll, to you know to bring that to life so there's a lot of pressure as a result of that um you know i i have you know i have a relatively small team i mean i have a very small team relative to a lot of the the other the, you know functional areas um mm -hmm. and yet i have a massive amount of responsibility in fact i you know while i'm not necessarily responsible for the execution of say you know our our achieving revenue goals and our retention goals or that kind of thing i have massive amounts of of um influence on how successful we are yeah um and so that's where the pressure comes in because it's um <laughs> there's always the 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 um the reality uh that you get from especially from selling teams which is I'm not getting enough or, you know, I'm not getting enough of the right ways in which I think I should be enabled. Um, <clears throat> and you do your best to continually adapt and, and uh, participate in that. But at the end of the day, you have to, you know, exert great amounts of influence and, and help to, to, you know, be very clear about the direction and, um, and not waver from that. Yeah. So that, that comes it, with a lot of, yeah. that comes with a lot of, that comes with that. I mean, there's just a lot of pressure in that because there, I, I've seen, I've seen others in the role who, um, who respond a little bit too much to all of the commentary and you wind up, mm. you, you even see, you've even seen this with some, some leaders that we've worked with you and I in the past, yeah. they, yeah. they, yeah. There's the you know there's the, the 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 loud noise that they're hearing in their ear, and and they just they move to that, um, and mm -hmm. and what happens is you know you get you you actually take take the organization off of the rails and you start going off you know sort of off the the the, the off plan, and mm -hmm. you start bouncing around and it be, and you lose momentum. I think yeah. it's one thing to be experimental; it's another thing to just um, to be reactive. And I think if you're too react too reactive, I think it 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 really diminishes the impact that you can have. As as you're saying this, I'm just thinking about the ripple effects that are taking place in the market as well. When if the employees are not consistent in terms of what they're saying or what they're doing, because for whatever reason, executive leadership are not aligned, and then things are changing all the time then your your customers in the market are then confused because there isn't that consistency of message and et cetera. So yeah, that, that really resonates. The position that you're at, you've been doing this a little while. Um, what does a typical, is there a typical day? And if so, what does it look like? And I want details. I want to know 
the what time do you get up do you have any routines we should know about um any structures to particular days or the week in general when does it end i, I want details yeah um I would say the days are reasonably predictable. Um, um, every day for me begins with um, w <laughs> with waking up, putting on my gym clothes, getting a coffee, and going to the gym. You know, nice. or or on a beautiful day, going to the park uh, and and taking you know going for a long walk. Um, I it's just how I have to start the day. Uh, mm -hmm. It wakes it, it wakes my body up. Um, I feel better, um, and and oftentimes if I'm in a you know, if I'm in a, a in a training session, <clears throat> I'll put I'll push or be pushed to go to a level that I might not um, mm -hmm. have done on my own. And I think, well, if I could do that, then I can handle a lot that might come my way during the day. Right. There you go. Or if I'm too tired and just dragging my butt out of bed, you know, yeah. it's like, OK, that's you know, that's a good thing. Right. You push through the, you know, the malaise. Yeah. Um. So that's how I start my day. Um. And then I'm, and then I often, um, uh, you know, I'll make sure that I eat well, eat immediately after that, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I get started. I, I should say that usually before I leave to go out, um, and I'm up pretty early. Um, I'm always checking to see if there's anything urgent that I mm -hmm. need to respond to because we have international teams, right? So people have been working, um, you know, for a while. So I will always check Slack and email uh, to make sure that that I can address things. And I, I'll do that before I, you know, I, I leave. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the days are different based upon how we've scheduled things. I would say the norm um, is that mon Monday I'll have, um, I'll have some important meetings that set us up for our Tuesday executive meetings. And we have mm -hmm. like a two and a half hour executive meeting every Tuesday. Oh, wow. So, so we prepare a weekly dashboard and and um and we provide that usually by tuesday morning <clears throat> um so everybody can can read through you know what may be happening in each functional area mm -hmm. um so we have meetings to get prepared for that um and then i have some one-on-ones um most of my one-on-ones take place on thursday or friday <clears throat> but i have one-on-one -on -one, i have one-on-ones or one-on-three with members of the executive team at the beginning of the week so we can address anything that might potentially come up you know during our our, our team meeting um so that, so tuesday is <clears throat> is is typically involved with that um and then i ha i usually have some outside meetings meaning we're we're working with some others on the outside that I'll schedule for tuesday and then wednesday and thursday i'm often um hosting our own podcast um go. So we have, um, you know, we have uh, they have prep sessions, which we do before every every actual recording, or we do the recording um, because I know that my schedule is not as not as intense on those days. So I'm actually have I'm I'm better able to to be a better host <laughs> and have a, have a proper have a proper conversation. And then, as I said, Thursdays and Fridays, I have I have one on ones um, with my team. Yeah. Um, so that's what a typical week is like. I, um, I, 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 I try to, so the day starts, you know, by seven. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and I'd say I, it ends six, six thirty. Uh -huh. Um, although I'm, I'm definitely checking. I, I try to check well in advance of before I go to sleep, but make sure that, cause we also work, you know, with California. So I want to make sure that things that I've perhaps shared with, um, well, our CEO who's based in Santa Barbara, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm able to see what his thoughts might be. And that happened actually um, last night, as an example, I worked on something for him uh, yesterday and, mm -hmm. um, and I hadn't seen anything before I went out to dinner. Um, and I just knew that he would have replied to me Mm -hmm. um before i went so i just checked and sure enough he did you know so it's just helpful for to know that coming into the day because then i can address anything that might yeah you know he he might he's up pretty early so that i that he might have on his mind so that's what the typical day is like and i i'd say i try to i actually try you know try to stay home 
I would say, you know, three or four nights out of the week, I'll go out, uh, maybe one night during the week. I try not to get up to go out too much because, um, I just find that I just, my rest is really important, yeah. um, during the week. And if I'm out late, it starts, it just, I won't miss my workout, which means mm-hmm. I'll have less sleep if I, if I'm out. Yeah. I was I was going to ask you how do you unwind um at the end of a long day so it sounds as though by doing as little as possible is what I'm hearing is that is that fair Yeah well I I, I for sure I try to make sure I have a good you know I have a good meal uh, yeah. that's 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 super important um and <clears throat> I um I've been watching a lot of documentaries lately uh uh-huh. so um I I I enjoy that just it's just sort of the you know the person behind you know, behind the, the sport or the activity. Mm -hmm. And I always, I always find that to be uh, quite fascinating. Um, So that's, that's something I do. And then I I'll always try to read um, Mm -hmm. a a little before I go to sleep. Um, That usually doesn't last very long because Mm -hmm. that that puts me to sleep. The wave of sleep. Yeah. Wins, wins that one. Yeah, exactly. I think when my, when my head goes, as soon as my head goes back, you know, into a reclined position, I'm done. Yeah. (laughs) When you were a kid, did you think to yourself, I want to be a marketing leader when I grow up? No, absolutely not. Um, So um, I say this, even though I was, you know, I think, as you know, I was surrounded by, yeah, uh, by my parents who were kind of part of the broader space. My dad was an animator and created a lot of the classic animated commercials we grew up with, Mm -hmm. as well as um, some educational television um, programs, as well as actually some, some, um, some small films. Uh, So, you know, that was always, there was sort of art and commercialism as it were at play at home. My mom, um, started her career before I showed up uh, as a writer um, for an advertising agency and then wound up writing plays and all of that in our local community for the kids to put on, um, even some for the adults. <clears throat> so I was surrounded by it. And I, I would say the way that influenced me was after I realized I was not going to be a professional baseball player, um, which was my first ambition. It was, was it? There you go. Uh, yeah. And then... Um, and then I wasn't going to be a professional tennis player, uh-huh. which was my 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 second ambition. Uh, I started tennis pretty late, so that was I was sort of never destined to be able to be successful in it. But I but I tried for uh-huh. a short while. Um, I knew that I wanted to. It's interesting. I knew that I wanted to. What I was really interested in as I got older was telling the story of the people behind the sport, mm. and so I. I was, um, I thought, oh, well, I'm, you know, decent communicator. I've, I, you know, I, I, I had a, a, a major in uh, literature um, and uh, actually double majored in economics as well. And then, so I thought, oh, I'll go and work for CBS Sports and tell the stories of the, you know, the, well, like the wide world of sports, you know, the pursuit of, of success and, you know, what failure, failure looks like. So. But um, yeah, that didn't work out. I probably didn't understand enough about how to go about it because I've always carried that forward uh, as 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 I, you know what what appeals to me. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? It does. It no, it absolutely does. Because um, you know, some people genuinely set out to, and very few that I know, by the way. Um, set out on this journey from a young age and, and they know exactly what they want to be when they grow up and they go do it. I personally had absolutely no idea. And that was quite a stress, you know, a stressor for me. And I got into sales because my um, my older sister and her husband were in sales and they used to have some funny conversations um, over the dinner table. But then I also saw the kind of lifestyle they had and the money they were obviously earning. So that influenced me. But I, I, I think I got I got to the age of, how old was I know when I launched uh, Numentum 40? And that's when I knew when I wanted to be. <laughs> Everyone seems to have an opinion on marketing, Tom, and what it should be. So what do you think non-marketers 
get wrong about the industry? Hmm. Um, so I, I, there's probably two two things that I I would talk about. Um, maybe I'll start. I'll start with the um, the second, and that mm. is, um, and that is the relationship that you have with the selling organization. Mm. And um, there's a, you know there, there's a constant tension between marketing and sales, mm -hmm. um, but the reality is that I believe that marketing can help increase the success of your ability to sell mm -hmm. and so if you have that perspective then you need to of course hear and get input from the selling organization you should participate as much as you can in those efforts have those conversations with those customers and prospects yourself or uh, alongside the sales teams so you're hearing firsthand because you're able to maybe hear things the sales teams might not mm -hmm. um, but you also need to be you need to be committed, right, to what you what you think is the most important um, thing to do while helping to increase the odds of their success. And the reason I say that is is because of the first, which mm -hmm. is that the mark mar the marketing activity is really the expression of the company's strategy. Mm -hmm. And and it and if you don't understand that, then you can be all over the place. Mm. so you know mark marketing brings to life what the company stands for what it believes in how it's unique how it's uniquely different how it's perhaps comparatively different um and um and and really why why people should you know should 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 pay attention to to who you are um and so <clears throat> that will help you, I think, create focus because mm -hmm. it's really, it's really easy. Like I said earlier in our conversation, it's really easy to um, react to a lot of those inputs. Yeah. I actually, you know, I, I will certainly listen to what anyone says, um, but, um, but I know what it is to, to get to those very few, you know, those vital few objectives. I know what it is that we need to do. And it's, you know, it's all, it's forward leaning, right? That That's part of the work because if you're always addressing the here and now, you're never going to get ahead. And right. so, you know, you have to be forward leaning in terms of how you position the business and also, you know, how you market the business and frankly, how you represent what it is you have to offer because people want to be able to to purchase certainly the kinds of software you and I've been used to selling that, that are going to last them into the future, Right. You're not only addressing what their needs are today, but you're actually helping them advance their own businesses. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I think that those those are the two things that maybe yeah. marketers need to address. One is that you are articulating the company strategy day in and day out in lots of ways and lots of different conversations, um, and and you know and 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 you're helping to in, and at the same time you have to help increase the odds of success of the selling teams but you but but you have to pay attention to the first in order to do that as well yeah. So. Yeah. and and the bit you said does it resonates so much where being present with the customers with the prospects and listening firsthand and, and hearing things that perhaps your sales counterparts don't hear is so important but not every marketing organization does that as well as they should. And I know you all uh, focus on that and you personally have made that part of what you do for such a long time. So um, that's a great call out. Now, big question for you. Mm. Don't blush, right? But I'm going to read out some of the um, success that you've had throughout your career. And before I do that, I want you to think of pivotal moments, right? Most people have at least one pivotal moment in the career. So, um, so you're known for helping pioneering companies achieve that that coveted leadership position uh, in, a, in, a, in an industry category, and sometimes creating categories. Now, Signal FX, acquired by Splunk, just over 1 billion. Sprinkler, last valued for three, I think it's actually 4 billion. AppNexus, acquired by AT&T for 1.6 billion. PTC, 
Uh, pivoted from cab vendor to PLM leader. Remember that? Red Hat, second highest IPO in NASDAQ history. I mean, you have had some phenomenal success that you have generated and driven yourself. Is there at any point, either in anything that I've just read or even prior, a pivotal moment that you look back on and go, yeah, that's when things started happening for, for me? Um, I think there are two. Uh, there are two, actually. Um, um, the first was at Red Hat and the second was at PTC. Hmm. Um, so at Red Hat, I, I had, well, I had never worked inside at a software company. I'd always been on the outside. I'd been a consultant, you know, I've been, I've been in agencies. I, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I worked with a lot of them, you know, from Lotus to, IBM and um, and then lots of startups in the research triangle area. I thought I knew a lot about their business, mm. but when I, after having spent a lot of time on the outside working with Red Hat, which is how I got to know the the two founders, <clears throat> and they asked me to join them, um, I thought, wow, because I, I I saw the the big opportunity that they represented mm. relative to how things had been open source versus proprietary software. It's hard to even think about proprietary software yeah. these days. Um, I thought, what a what a phenomenal sort of marketing opportunity, right? And, um, um, but the, the, the pivotal moment in that experience was I entered in, like I literally, I, if, if I had always worked, I don't know, in the, in the glass room, you know, on the executive floor, with the uh, conversations about what this would mean for the world at large. Mm -hmm. When I actually got there, I was taken downstairs below, you know, below uh, light uh, and into the depths of a super um, technical organization. Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, I felt like Maybe like Rebecca, I felt like I, you know, I moved to a foreign country and I had no idea what they were saying. Yeah. Um, because they had their own language, literally their own language. Um, it was super technical. And and the people that they started to bring in, um, including a, a, a president, came from deep technology companies and were used to operating at that level. And so the, the pivotal moment for me was, I just didn't understand the the business as well as I needed to technically, mm -hmm. even though what I did on the surface, uh, mm -hmm. not really on the surface, but from at the, at the sort of highest point of the spear was the right thing. I could, I, I just wasn't comfortable um, in being able to, to operate within that environment. Yeah. Um, so my next experience, fortunately, I was recruited to to do a public turnaround at PTC, and I realized that the most important thing that I needed to do was to understand the the business and mm -hmm. and 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 also the technical, you know, offerings that we had. And so, one of the first things I did was I went on the road with our the, the guy who is now and has been C, CEO of the company. Uh, who was then put in charge of all product. Mm -hmm. And I went on the road with him um, and listened to him and talked to him and, you know, spent a lot of time with his team. And um, I was really able to immerse myself in the business to be able to have a conversation that was almost as, you know, on the same level as the conversations they were having with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then apply my ability to take all of that and put it at a different level than they had ever been able to do and he knew it and got it and so i really formed a great partnership with him whereas at red hat i felt really alone honestly and what alone it was like the ce the two co-founders and i related to each other really well mm -hmm. um, because we were we saw the massive opportunity of what we were doing um but the opera the way the business operated was very different Mm. And and um, and and at PTC, I was able to connect both of those things uh, and pull, literally pull it up and out. 
and yeah. um, it, it it caused them to be well. It gave them a reason to to live for another day, and um, and they've gone on to be very successful now again. Yeah, seems like you created a playbook. I mean, I've seen it in action. Um, a playbook that just works, and it's um, a repeatable one. But um, but boy, do you go and l- learn and you dig deep before you um, deploy it. It's uh, it's a joy to see, Tom. take you outside of work a little bit now so um tell me a little bit about yourself outside of work what are two or three things that bring you joy um i love to travel uh so um and um both to new places but also places that i've been to Mm -hmm. um and so i i would say when i go to italy uh which i try to do at least twice a year I'm really happy. I, uh, I mean, my roots are Italian, my, you know, but I just, I just love, I just love, I love everything about it. I love the language, the food, the spirit, uh, the fashion, uh, the quality of life. Um, and I would say I'm very happy when I'm there. Um, I was there, um, in, uh, in May, uh, the end, middle to end of May. And, uh, it was just, it was a great escape. Yeah. um it, it was a it was a great escape and i've 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 since become some become friends with you know some locals and that's all and we continue you know those relationships uh throughout the year which is really nice um so that's that's one i would say the other thing that gives me great joy is a really good meal <laughs> yeah i mean it's, yeah, as sim- yeah. it's as simple as that and um i mean i grew up with you know amazing amazing cooks you know my mom my grandmother my sisters and um you know so when i go out for a meal i'm i'm not only looking you know to have a nice experience in a nice place but but the food's really important <laughs> um so i'll always prioritize that um and i don't know i think the other thing is just the, the last thing is just um kind of being being mindful of other people um in in my life um that may be having you know a tricky time and sometimes it's like super challenging time and as i i've made a commitment that anytime i think of someone i will write to or call them Mm. um like right then not like i'm going to make a note to do it at another point i just do it right then and there and and that i i would say that that I'm happy about doing that. Um, it there's a, it just feels like the right thing to do. So um, yeah, so those are very very different. <laughs> yeah, Three right. Different, very different experiences, but um, yeah, we've had we've had some. You know, I mean, we all do, right? But we, there's been some challenges, um, illnesses, deaths, etc. In, in our family, and um, and I've. I've taken a lot of responsibility for helping those that I can. Yeah. So, um, and I, and, and it's not just one and done, right. It's like staying, staying the course. And, um, when you least expect it, it's like, Oh, this, this is uncle Tom calling, you know, like, should I answer it or not? And I'm most time they're answering now. So that's yeah. nice. I think the state of the world right now, I think if everyone did what you've just described and when you think of that one person, reach out check in on them i i do that as well which is why it resonates and so often the recipient is going through stuff sometimes that you didn't even know about before you reached out and yeah. uh, that's all it takes you know to turn that person's not just day around but just you know experience that they're going through around as well um it's huge What would you tell your 12 year old self? Um, we should have recorded the concert. So, <laughs> yes, because so believe it or not, I was in a band. <clears throat> Is that right? Okay. I was in a band called the Chaparrells. Wow. Like, yeah. Uh, so in 11th, uh, when I was 11 and 12, uh, uh-huh. we, we were in a band, three guitars and a drummer, like go figure. 
Uh -huh. And um, and we played a lot of, you know, obviously we played a lot of covers. We actually wrote a couple of songs, but we yeah. played, you know, the Christmas, you know, concert um, for our sixth grade uh, um, in sixth grade. And then, you know, we we, we played some parties uh -huh. and I oh, I mean, I just wished I just I just wished we had a recording, not even a video, right? Just not even a photo like a, just a recording of what it sounded like because uh -huh. because the magic that happened when when the, the the actually the first time I got in a room and start it was playing with someone else and then multiple people uh, the 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 experience was so wonderful um that I I I got a, I got a lot of joy from it so um I just wish I wish that happened because I have no record of it. I still have the guitar, but I have no yeah. record of it. Do you still yeah. play? I still play a bit, yeah. Okay. Um just as a it's a proud father story. My my um one of the lessons I I wanted my son to have was um to take piano lessons. He started mm -hmm. at age five and I told him, I said, someday you're gonna thank me for for not letting you quit. <laughs> um, because you're going to want to quit. And mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I, my parents allowed me to quit when I was taking piano lessons. Um, but music is always part of my family. My dad, my my grandmother's side of the family were musicians. My father played piano every day of his life um, for, mo for sometimes multiple hours. But my son, who <clears throat> went on to absolutely love music, uh, was a uh, had a couple of shows in the college radio station, and, and today when he's when he's not working um at google and on google maps uh mm -hmm. and google earth he has a he's in a band and um and so i'm I'm actually going to go out to san francisco to see them play uh a week from friday uh oh, wow. at the independent anybody wants to go like <laughs> yeah super green music and they're going to be releasing their second song um so uh yeah so I'm glad I'm glad that they've got to they've you know captured everything that they're doing obviously mm -hmm. in today. But I wished that I had just a leave and a little recording. Yeah, I, I wish too. I would have loved to have uh, <laughs> seen. You learn something about people every single day. So I want to bring it home, Tom, with with um with a a question for you to to think about and answer for the, from a from a future lens. So if you could just wave your hand and change one thing about the business world and then also about the world in general, what would those things be? Oh, the thing that comes to mind, um, yeah, the, th the thing that comes to mind is I wish that there were more people like, like Brett Kane, um, and 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 so I'll describe. So Brett is the um, is the the CEO of 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 Airship, and I <clears throat> I made a conscious decision post the acquisition of Signal Effects by Splunk. I made the conscious decision um, to work for if I was going to go back to work was to work for someone that I knew. Mm -hmm. someone that I respected and someone who I ultimately thought was a good guy. Yeah. And, and he is every bit of that and more. And it is such a pleasure to work with him. He's a great CEO. He's, he, he, he's decisive. He's, you know, he's able to have the tough conversations, but in a way that's, that's just very, um, I hate to say human, but it's it's very respectful. Mm. And um, and the reason I say that is because I think with all of the negativity that swirls around every day that we, you know, this, this, this environment within which we live, this broader environment with, within which we live, it creates a lot of anger and disruption. And, and I just think that this, there's, it's so much better if you, if, if, I mean, that's reality, but it's so much better if, if you can actually be both a good business person and a good person. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, 
I try to be that person. Um, I'm sure I don't always, I'm not always successful. I have my own moments, right? Um, of doesn't whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, it, I mean, look, the, you know, I, I work with you because you're, you're, you're brilliant at what you do. I learn from you uh, all the time. And, and I, I know, who, I know who you are as a person and how you operate. And, and yeah, you know, you, you can be tough when you need to be tough. Uh, and that's good. Um, but, but you're always super respectful and, um, you're a pleasure to, you know, to work with and interact with. And so I'd rather surround myself working with people like you than with other people who might be amazing and they're absolute, like yeah. they just, they just create negativity. Um, yeah. and, and I, I just don't have room for that anymore. Life's too short. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you, my friend. A pleasure as always having you on the speaker series. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. I, uh, I wish you much success. Thank you. If there's anything I can do, uh, you know, for you in the business, let me know. And uh, maybe we can have you as a guest on, uh, on our show, Masters of Max. Oh, I would love that. I'll take you up yeah. on that.